This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1983, two beautiful young women on holiday from Sweden were murdered while hitchhiking in California. The case gathered dust until 1991, when an anonymous phone call sparked a renewed search for the unknown killer. As a young boy, Joe Saw was teased by schoolmates because he had been adopted. As an adult, Joe would learn the painful truth about his past. He had been bought and sold by a notorious baby broker. In 1974, a successful businessman named Gary Simmons disappeared on the same day he paid $30,000 for a prize horse. No one had any idea where he had gone until Gary Simmons' skeleton was found hidden in a cave almost 20 years later. Also tonight, a fascinating update on our story about legendary aviator Amelia Earhart, who disappeared in 1937. Recently, an aviation archaeologist made headlines claiming he had solved the mystery of Amelia Earhart's last flight. Others say he is just plain wrong. Join me. For every mystery, there is someone who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. Consulate of Sweden. I have some information. Excuse me. On September 26, 1991, a bizarre anonymous phone call came into the Swedish consulate in San Diego, California. Two hitchhikers? Yes, two Swedish girls. The caller went on to describe a double murder. Incredibly, a double murder that had taken place a full eight years earlier. This was a first solid lead since 1983. It all began on July 24th of that year, behind a gas station in the City of Commerce, a Los Angeles suburb. A station attendant went to dump trash. He looked inside the dumpster and saw a couple of backpacks. Checking further, he found clothing, diaries. There were rolls of film, passports, wallets, um, many of the things that, that you would expect tourists to have collected in a several month tour of the United States. The items in the dumpster belong to two Swedish nationals, Marie Lillienberg, 23, and Maria Valin, 25. They had failed to show up for their return flight to Sweden that day. The fathers of both women came to California, hoping to find their daughters by means of widespread media attention. Very extremely worried. I I'll tell you that they had never. During the next three never, weeks, more than 50 never, sightings of Maria Valin uh, and Marie Lillienberg were reported. All were checked out, but none of them could be confirmed. That's not the nature of my daughter. Absolutely. I'll tell you that she is the one who, who stick to every promise made. That's her nature. Hey, come here. What is that? Oh, let's go find out. Then on August 18th, 1983, in Santa Barbara County, California, a missing persons case became a murder investigation. Two deer hunters noticed a skeletonized arm. Probably a coyote had pulled one of the arms off and drug it out into the open. Checking further, they found other remains uh, hidden under brush there. Those remains were positively identified as being Marie Lillienberg and Maria Valen. An autopsy showed that both women had been stabbed to death, as well as sexually assaulted. Sheriff's detectives learned that the two young women had met in January of 1983 
at a resort hotel in Vail, Colorado, where they both worked as chambermaids. When the ski season ended, they decided to hitchhike around California before heading back home to Sweden. Marie uh, Lillienberg and Maria Valen thought that it was safe to hitchhike. They had been cautioned by Swedish friends and by Americans that it was not safe to hitchhike. But they felt that they would be able to size up persons giving them a ride. They would be able to sense whether this was a dangerous situation or not. Maria Valen carried a small knife with her, and she felt that she would be able to, uh, to defend herself in, in any type of a situation where she was threatened. Young Swedes come to the United States from a culture which is uh, entirely homogeneous and middle class. There are only eight million people in Sweden. It is a more open and, if you will, a more, more trusting environment. They yeah, therefore tend to come to the United States and remain as trusting as they were in Sweden. So sometimes they do run into hey, trouble. How are you doing? Fine, how are you? Are you going to San Francisco? Well, I can take you about halfway there. Is that cool? Okay, Great. great. When the gas station attendant found the knapsacks in the dumpster, he also found a travel diary and two rolls of undeveloped film. Working from these photographs, as well as a diary, investigators established the women's itinerary and contacted several truck drivers who had given Marie and Maria rides. Hi. Where are you girls going? We're going to Mark Hansen. A trucker from San Diego, California, remembered them well. A lot of truck drivers out there have daughters, and if they do see girls out hitchhiking, they try to take care of them. Talked about that they shouldn't be hitchhiking, huh? maybe being too much of a big brother and a little bit of a lecture on the way up about that it wasn't safe, it wasn't like being in Europe, that women didn't hitchhike in the United States anymore. And they didn't seem terribly concerned that they felt they would be safe being together. Hansen drove the women from San Diego to Compton, just south of Los Angeles, where he arranged another ride for them at a truck stop. Hey, could you use some company? Yeah, I can give him a ride. Great. Oh, great. There you go. You too. The second truck driver dropped the women off in Oakland, Bye -bye. just across the bay from San Francisco. Take care. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Maria Valin and Marie Lillianburg were last seen in Redwood City, California, on July 22, 1983 heading back to Los Angeles so they could catch their flight to Sweden two days later. On the very day they were scheduled to depart, their backpacks and personal effects were found in the city of Commerce. Four weeks later, the hunters discovered their bodies near Santa Barbara. For eight years, the investigation into the murders of Marie Lillianberg and Maria Volin remained at a standstill. Hitchhikers? Yes, two Swedish girls. The anonymous phone call came into the Swedish consulate. He was Canadian. Yes, he was skinny and his He was said that he knew a fellow whom he had seen on a regular basis, Can who was more? from Canada, who would come down every winter in his van to go through San Diego to Mexico. He said that. Uh, on one occasion in 1983, the man had come through and uh, mentioned that he had met two Swedish girls who had tried to con him. The caller also described the van. He said he drove a white van with a green canoe on the top, and that uh, this was very recognizable, and a number of people knew it. Girls need a lift? Yes. We are going to Los Angeles. He gave a description of the man. He said he was over six feet, uh, slight build, 175 pounds, uh, thinning red hair, long pointed nose, protruding watery eyes. I don't believe that the call was a hoax. We have to squeeze in here, there's not a lot of room. My regret is that the caller was unwilling to identify himself uh, if he would step forward even now and call us again, even uh, anonymously, to provide further information, it might be very helpful. It's not only frustrating that we have not been able to find the persons responsible for these slains, but also the, considering the probability that there may be other slains across the country that this killer is responsible for as well. I think 
the moral of the story is, is quite simple, that it is just very, very dangerous to hitchhike. And in the case of women hitchhiking, it could very easily turn up in this type of a situation. When we return, an aviation expert believes he has solved the mystery of Amelia Earhart's final flight. Others disagree. One of the most popular stories we have featured is a fascinating mystery of legendary aviator Amelia Earhart. Recently, she once again made front page news. Life magazine even carried an exclusive six page spread after aviation archaeologist Richard Gillespie announced to the world that he had finally solved the mystery of Amelia Earhart's final flight. Six decades ago, Amelia Earhart captured the heart and spirit of an entire generation. Part all-American girl, part daredevil, she was the perfect hero for her time. On May 20th, 1937, Amelia and her navigator, Fred Noonan, began a daring attempt to circumnavigate the world in this twin-engine Lockheed 10 Electra. They never returned. On July 2nd, they disappeared en route to tiny Howland Island in the South Pacific. A massive search turned up no trace of Amelia, Fred, or their airplane. They were officially declared lost at sea. But as the years passed, rumors surfaced that Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan ended up on the island of Saipan, 2,500 miles from Howland Island. At the time of Earhart and Noonan's disappearance, Saipan was occupied by the Japanese army. In 1944, American forces liberated the island among the soldiers stationed on Saipan was this man, Thomas Devine. Devine claims he overheard a conversation between two Marines outside a guarded aircraft hangar at a remote location on the island. We got Amelia Earhart's plane in that hangar. The Marines were severely reprimanded by an official wearing civilian clothes. You come about that damn close to compromising the project right now. I'm telling you, I want you to sit down do your jobs and shut up, do you understand? Devine claims that later that same day, he actually saw Amelia Earhart's plane fly overhead. That night, he saw the Lockheed 10 Electra again, engulfed in flames. I saw that plane personally on three occasions that day. The last time the plane was in flames. This woman, Neva Blas, has lived on Saipan her entire life. She claims that Earhart and Noonan were captured by the Japanese as spies and that she actually witnessed Amelia Earhart's execution. Who's there? Were Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan taken prisoner and executed on the island of Saipan? Or did their plane, in fact, go down in the vast and unforgiving waters of the South Pacific? In 1989, the tiny, uninhabited island of Nikumaroro became the focal point of a new and intriguing theory. Nikumaroro is located 420 miles from Howland Island, Earhart's intended destination. Aviation archaeologist Richard Gillespie headed an expedition to search for evidence that Earhart and Noonan had been marooned on Nikumaroro. The expedition turned up this aluminum aircraft part, which at the time Gillespie believed may have come from Earhart's plane. This box doesn't constitute proof. What it does is constitute sufficient evidence to merit a return to Nikumaroro to find and photograph the ultimate proof, the airplane itself. In October of 1991, Richard Gillespie mounted a second expedition to Nikumaroro. Searchers found several intriguing artifacts, which Gillespie claims are indisputable proof that Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan died on the island while awaiting rescue. On March 16, 1992, Gillespie presented his findings at a press conference in Washington, D.C. For you are artifacts which, along with recently discovered historical documents, conclusively solve the disappearance of Amelia Earhart. 
Among the items on display were these tattered remnants of a shoe, allegedly worn by Amelia Earhart, and this weathered piece of aluminum. According to Gillespie, it came from the fuselage of Earhart's Lockheed 10 Electra. The rivet pattern is the same. Four parallel rows of number three rivets. If Richard Gillespie is correct, then the final chapter of Amelia Earhart's story can be written. However, Gillespie's conclusions have been disputed by several experts. It was quite exciting that a new piece of evidence had been uncovered because there hasn't been much on Amelia Earhart in the last uh, few years. Uh, Elgin Long, noted historian and Earhart biographer, was asked by Gillespie to study detailed measurements and photographs of the aluminum section. Long assembled a panel of experts to compare the evidence with an airplane fuselage identical to Amelia Earhart's. When we uh, received the data, we made a template that was the exact same size and had all the rivet holes in it, just like the fragment that was found on Nicomaroro. We put this template up to the bottom of the airplane and we compared the rivet lines with the rivets on the actual airplane. You notice that there's no row of fasteners along here. They didn't match at all. There was rivet holes where there shouldn't be any rivets, and there weren't rivet holes where there should be rivets. What do you think? The panel compared the template to nearly every section of the airplane. No match could be found. There's no way that piece could have come from a Lockheed 10 or Amelia Earhart's airplane. Richard Gillespie attributes discrepancies in the rivet patterns to repairs which were made on Earhart's plane during her first attempt to fly around the world. The repair had to be exactly per the engineering orders. Panel consultant and former Lockheed engineer Ed Werner disagrees. He argues that all repairs made on Earhart's plane were done to strict factory specifications. At first, I was kind of happy that the controversy was over. But then I'm very disappointed now to come to the conclusion that it can't be part of her airplane. According to Richard Gillespie, the National Transportation Safety Board has concluded that the aluminum fragment is consistent with materials used to build Lockheed 10 Electras. However, they could not confirm that it came from Amelia Earhart's plane. So for now at least, Amelia Earhart's disappearance remains an unsolved mystery. On a previous broadcast, we brought you the chilling story of a woman named Georgia Tan. For more than 20 years, Tan used her well-known Tennessee orphanage as a front for a highly illegal black market baby ring. Thanks to our viewers, nearly 200 of the children placed for adoption by Georgia Tan have been reunited with their birth families. Such happy endings are certainly gratifying, but the appalling fact remains that Georgia Tan was not the only one of her kind. Another notorious baby broker was Bessie Bernard, who bought and sold thousands of children. One of them would learn of his adoption in a very painful way. His story begins almost 50 years ago in Nyack, New York. In 1944, Joe Saul was in his first months of kindergarten. What'd you do that for? Because you're an adopted kid. I'm what? An adopted kid. Well, I didn't know what that meant, except I knew it was bad because of the way they said it. And um, I, I ran home crying and um, asked my mother what, what that meant and, and was I in fact adopted, still not knowing what the word meant, and she said, yes, um, your, your real, real parents, parents were killed. Then. They were killed in a car crash. But you're safe, and now we're your real parents, and we love you so much. Joe had been adopted as an infant in 1939 by Florence and Charles Saul. Charles was a successful attorney who died unexpectedly in 1960. It was not until 20 years later that Joe learned his birth parents had not died in a car accident after all, a fact which his mother reluctantly confirmed. She said that my father handled the whole thing and she really didn't want to know and, and not only that, he didn't want to tell her. He told her that, that he had fixed it so that nobody could ever find out anything. 
um, which is very scary for me. Here's your father's old files. You can use our library if you'd like. Thanks a lot. After extensive maneuvering, Joe gained access to his father's records. Filled with anticipation, he began the search for his origins. I found that there was a file that he had left with all the letters that he had written looking for a baby and, and um, information on me, which the information was that my name was Robert Wilson when I was born, that my birthday was November 3rd, 1939, and um, that my mother's name was Ruth Haverman. And uh, there were the, the adoption decree. Um, I had never seen any of this. It was, it just, it just washed me with all sorts of emotion. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, is this 677 Lexington Avenue? Yes, I know that my is. birth mother was supposed to have lived at 677 oh, Lexington here Avenue here in New York years. City. Does the name Ruth Haverman mean anything to you? No, no one. But there was never a Haverman at 677 no, Lexington not Avenue. Here. I know that there was a family named Habersack that lived at, at 677 Lexington Avenue. And that building apparently was an unwed mother's home. Disheartened, Joe went back to the old files. He discovered that his father had corresponded regularly with an adoption agent named Bessie Bernard. In the New York City archives, Joe found out more about Bessie Bernard than he had ever bargained for. As I searched to try and find out who Bessie Bernard was, um, I came across articles in the New York Times from 1949 when she was arrested for baby selling um, and, and realized that I was a black market baby, that I was sold, um, which my mother confirmed, you know, that I was bought. And, and that was painful. Um, it was, it's like, I felt like a piece of property. Um, it's, it's, it's a strange feeling to know that somebody paid money for you. That as you put in the Miami Herald, it was great. There Bessie was Bernard lived with her father in Manhattan. She used newspaper ads to round up infants for her thriving East Coast baby brokerage. Good. I didn't pay too much. We're making yeah. lots of dough. It's good. Bessie Bernard charged each adoptive couple up to $2,000, a huge sum at that time. She averaged 20 a month. She brought them in from Florida, from Hartford, Connecticut, Boston, anywhere she could get babies, she advertised. And she brought them in, had the births registered in New York, changed names. Um, it, it was vicious what, what she did. By 1949, the Manhattan District Attorney was on to Bessie Bernard. Mr. Bernard? Yeah. I'm Detective O'Brien. This is On October 8th of that year, two police department. officers armed with a search warrant the showed up at her apartment. Warrant, sir. Would you please stand over there? Hey, what's going on here? Are you Miss Bernard? Yeah, who wants stand to Stand over there with your father, yeah, please, ma'am. When the detective started to rummage through Bessie Bernard's purse, she went berserk. Hey, hey, you. Get out. Get out of my house. I want you out of my house. Get over there with your father. Get out. Did you hear what I said? Some believe that the little black book Bessie Bernard threw to her father contained the names of clients and other vital information. Bessie's father escaped, and the book was never recovered. Will the defendant please step forward? On June 30th, 1950, Bessie Bernard was found guilty of illegally placing children for adoption. At this time, is there anything you wish to say in your behalf? No. I hereby sentence you to one year in the women's penitentiary. Bessie Bernard never spent a day in jail. She paid a $2,500 fine to avoid serving her one-year sentence. Bessie Bernard died in 1989, taking her secrets with her. What makes me angry and, and, and fills me with pain is that because Bessie Bernard always changed things, birth dates and birth names and, and, and birth mother's names and places of birth that, that, that me and, and so many other people can't, can't find um, their family. And I, I need to find my family. When I was looking through the adoption file in my father's office and I saw all the letters that he had written to uh, adoption agencies and orphanages and war relief organizations. And, and I finally understand how much they wanted a child and why they did what they did. But 
It's impossible to think for me and many other adopted people about ever leaving the world when you don't know how you got here in the first place. And my mother could be alive. Like I could have a brother, a sister, cousins, aunts, uncles. Um, I need to know. I need to know who my family is. Joe Saul thinks his mother's name is either Ruth Haberman or Ruth Habersack. She may have had a friend named Lucy Bint. Joe's father is listed as Robert Wilson, an engineer who worked in Hartford, Connecticut. Joe Saul believes he was born in Manhattan on November 3, 1939, or one week earlier in Florida. Next, an unexpected discovery prompts a murder investigation. In November of 1991, Unsolved Mysteries received a very unusual letter from a man named Tyrone Rollins, who wanted us to look into a case. Rollins had unwittingly sparked a murder investigation after experiencing a number of strange premonitions, which he simply could not explain. In 1985, Tyrone Rollins was hired as a school bus driver in Independence, Missouri. Right from the start, he had an eerie feeling about the rocky outcroppings behind the bus yard. Every time I walked past them hills, I'd get the same feeling. I'd be sitting up in front of my bus, and I'd feel like somebody watching me from behind. And I'd look back there, and there wouldn't be nobody on the bus. For a while there, I just thought I was going crazy. This is strong feeling, like some pulling inside me, wanting me to do something, and I just couldn't figure out what it was. Finally, on October 16, 1991, Tyrone was overcome by the urge to investigate. On the north side of the hill, he discovered a hidden cave. That strong feeling was back again. I knew I had to go in there for some reason. It was like an amazing adrenaline rush. Just the feeling of being in there, I didn't know if it was from not knowing what was in there. When I shined my flashlight towards the rocks, you could see little tiny specks look like crystals. So I started examining the rocks, and it was just then that I happened to glance over and I seen a pair of boots. It was just shock. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Dental records would later confirm that the remains were those of Gary Simmons, a businessman from Overland Park, Kansas, 25 miles away. An autopsy revealed that he had been murdered, shot once in the head. Tyrone Rollins' startling discovery was about to become a nightmare for the police. They were confronted with a killing that had taken place 17 years earlier. Gary Simmons had mysteriously vanished in 1974. And at this point, investigation seemed almost futile. Yet the police had no choice. After all, someone had gotten away with murder for nearly two decades. In the 1970s, Gary Simmons owned and operated a lucrative chain of gas stations in the Kansas City area. His passionate avocation was horse trading. Yeah, beautiful horse. Gary always worked hard. And I believe he got involved in horses in order to have a form of relaxation and a means of doing something that was fun with his family. And it was a hobby that he had probably been involved in only two or three years prior to his disappearance. Hey, Gary. Hey, buddy, how you doing? Good, how you been? Good. Just got back from a show down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Man, I saw some of the most beautiful horses I've seen in a long time. Is that right? You bet. Anything I might be interested in? On October 14th, 1974, well, the day before he disappeared, Gary Simmons learned of a prize horse for sale. You know Tom Dixon? Tom Dixon. Yeah? 
Isn't he a member of the Appaloosa Association? Right, right. He had one of the most beautiful purebred Appaloosas I've seen in a long time. I raised him from a colt. How much is he asking for him? I'm not so sure he wants to sell him. He's asking $30,000 for him. $30,000? Whew! That must be some kind of horse. Oh, man, you just... The next morning, an agent acting for the horse's owner showed up at Gary Simmons' office. Hi, can I help you? Yeah, I'm here to see Mr. Simmons. Do you have an appointment? Uh, yeah, we talked earlier on the phone. Uh-huh. And your name, please? Tom Dixon. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning of an intricate transaction which lasted all day long and which police are still trying to piece together. Excuse me, Gary, there's a Tom Dixon here to see you? Oh, sure. Hi, Gary. Hi, Tom Dixon. At 10.15 a.m., Gary Simmons left his office with Dixon. About 20 minutes. OK, uh, I'll follow you. Sure. Simmons work. told his secretary okay. that he would return great. shortly, but he did not say where he was going. <laughs> 15 minutes later, Simmons Gary Simmons you? telephoned his secretary Hi, and instructed her to make out a $30,000 check uh -huh. to Tom Dixon. OK, 30000 Hi, can I help you with something? Yeah, I'm here to pick up 11 the check. 11 a.m. Dixon oh, picked right. up the check. Uh, yeah, didn't he call? Uh, yes, he did, and um, I've drawn up the check, but you're going to have to get Gary's signature on it. Dixon then took the check to right. Gary Simmons for his signature, but no one knows where the meeting took place. At 11.30 a.m., Gary Simmons was spotted at a truck stop 10 miles from his office. Owner saw Gary Simmons walking back and forth between the counter and the window. He remembers that Gary Simmons was alone and there did not seem to be anybody with him or waiting with him. It was the last time anyone ever saw Gary Simmons alive. Just before noon, Dixon showed up at Simmons Bank. Gary Simmons had called the president of the bank and had informed him that Tom Dixon was on his way to cash the check. The bank president recognized Gary Simmons' voice, and he did not recognize anything unusual in his voice to raise his suspicions either. $9,900, $10,000. dollars $30,000 total, Mr. Dixon. Don't you think you'd like to open up a uh, checking or a savings account? Dixon took delivery of the money in $100 oh, thanks, bills. Sir. He needed to pay off some debts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Around five hours later, Dixon showed up at a salvage yard 11 miles from the bank. He was driving Gary Simmons' Lincoln Continental. This morning, you never show. Well, I got busy. Where'd you get that Lincoln? Uh, it's, it's not my car. It's something I need to get rid of. I was wondering if you could uh, use your machine to sort of crush it for me. Yeah, I can make it flat for you. But you want to get rid of it, you're going to have to melt it. <clears throat> the Fed's been keeping a real close eye on the furnace. You got any uh, better ideas? Yeah. Put a brick on the accelerator and drive it to the Missouri River. Hey, thanks for the advice. I'll catch you later. All right. The next day, one of Tom Dixon's friends dropped him off at a truck stop near Kansas City. Dixon said he was planning to hop a cross-country rig. All right, we're ready to go, guys. It was the last time anyone load? ever saw Tom Dixon. Yeah. Hey, Six months went by. Then on April 25, 1975, Gary Simmons' Lincoln Continental was pulled out of the Missouri River less than six miles from the salvage yard where Dixon had tried to get rid of it. All you had was uh, two grown men that had disappeared. And that happens every day in America. It was unknown whether they had disappeared and not wanted to be found, or if foul play had indeed occurred. Upon finding Gary Simmons' body, it became a homicide investigation, and you had an actual crime. The finger of guilt appeared to point squarely at Tom Dixon. Police theorize that Simmons had been the victim of a bogus horse deal. The Dixon acting either alone or with a partner took Simmons' money and killed him. That in fact, there may never have been a horse at all. But then during the filming of this story, a new witness came forward. 
Oh, Gary knew a horse, that's for sure. He knew what a good horse was and... Roy Hilton is a local rancher who says he knew both Simmons and Dixon. He didn't like and didn't care about. On the day that Gary Simmons disappeared, Roy Hilton claims he heard Simmons making calls to his office and to the bank from the Whispering Downs horse ranch. Yeah, $30,000. He also states that Simmons showed him the horse he was buying. The signature. Just have it ready for him, okay? This murder didn't Thank come down much. over a $30,000 horse deal. It had to come down on some black market gas. I'm almost positive of that because Gary was, Simmons was having a problem getting fuel for his stations. Roy Hilton's testimony adds another layer of confusion to an already complex case. In the year prior to his death, Gary Simmons was struggling to save his chain of gas stations in the face of a 1973 Arab oil embargo. Gary was uh, affected drastically by the embargo. He closed uh, the bulk of his stations because of the fact of lack of gasoline. After Gary disappeared, there was numerous rumors that Gary might have been involved in black market gasoline. What Gary was involved in was buying gasoline on the spot market, and a lot of people labeled spot market gasoline because it was beyond government controls as black market gasoline, but it was one and the same and it was a perfectly legal transaction to buy gasoline on the spot market, and most oil companies did so. Who murdered Gary Simmons and why? There may be only one man who can answer both of those questions. Tom Dixon. A warrant has been issued for Dixon's arrest on charges of auto theft. When he disappeared in 1974, he was 42 years old. This photograph has been aged to show how Tom Dixon might look today at 60. He is five feet, eight inches tall, with brown or graying hair and green eyes. He may be working as a house painter or general contractor. On a previous broadcast, we featured the story of Jackie Dragon, who was adopted by a California couple when she was just an infant. When Jackie was 12, she came across her adoption papers and learned the names of her birth parents. It was a big thing. It was a, it was a turning point. It was something that I knew from that point on that someday I would find those people in that paper and that I had to, that they were real. In July of 1990, after nine years of searching, Jackie finally tracked down her biological mother, Marge Ryder. Hi, may I speak with Marge Ryder, please? Speaking. Marge was living in Winchester, Illinois. The phone call from Jackie was totally unexpected. 1964 mean anything to you? I was already sitting down and I felt like I had just fallen into a chair because it was, I've never had a shock like that before. Well, do you have time During the course of the conversation, Jackie was surprised to learn that she had three sisters whom she had never met. Only the youngest, Tracy, was raised by Marge. It, would, it was very exciting. I couldn't believe it. It's like, there's more? You're kidding. There's something more that I didn't know? During a poignant reunion with Marge, Jackie learned that her two other sisters, Laura May and Dawn Marie, had also been placed for adoption. Wow, you can definitely tell it's family. I would love the opportunity to find my sisters. I would hope, you know, I like to think that somewhere, wherever they are, that they know that they're adopted and that they wonder where they came from. They were mine. I did love them. I do love them. And it would be nice to make the family complete again. Thanks to our viewers. Jackie Dragon and Marge Ryder's dream of reuniting their family finally came true when they were contacted by Laura May and Dawn Marie. Dawn Marie, whose adoptive name is Susan, owns her own business in Santa Barbara, California. Laura May, Marge's oldest daughter, is now married and lives in Mississippi. Three months after our broadcast, Laura May arrived at her sister Jackie's home in Glendale, California. Marge and her youngest daughter, Tracy, had flown in from Illinois for this very special reunion. Thank you so much on the phone. Yeah. Oh. This is Tracy. Hi, this is your sister, Tracy. 
Meeting them was really nerve-wracking because it's like I wasn't quite sure what to expect and what they would expect of me. Your <laughs> and then after I got here, it's just all seemed to flow. It was very natural. Yes. The last time I remember seeing Laura, she was in a high chair. And now here she is all grown up, and I'm still looking for this little girl. You know, and that's, it's kind of hard. Hi, Susan. Oh, it's good to meet you. A short time later, the circle was finally completed with the arrival of Marge's other daughter, Susan. Okay. <laughs> um, I grew up knowing that I was adopted, but I didn't know anything about who my real parents were. And it's nice to know, you know, who your family is and you know, what your background is, you know, and learn more about them. I think when I first started feeling really comfortable was when we went out and took some Polaroids. And it was a really neat feeling to have a picture right in front of me and see all of us standing together. It's a very once in a lifetime kind of a thing to find a sister that you've never met. Everybody smile. <laughs> Each one is totally individual. They're all strong, I've found out. And they've done good with their lives. I'm proud of all four of them. Wholesale medical supply distributor wanted. Investment of $18,000 minimum required for necessary inventory. During the past year, this advertisement was placed in over 90 newspapers all across America by a company called Fidelity National Medical Supply Incorporated. The ad seemed to offer the perfect opportunity for enterprising individuals who'd always dreamed of owning their own business. Fidelity National was based in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. They extended an open invitation to potential investors to visit the company headquarters. One person who took advantage of the offer was a man whom we will call Robert Jones. He has asked that we not reveal his true identity. On January 24, 1992, Robert Jones was driven to the company offices in a limousine provided by Fidelity National. Jones, who had arrived in town the day before, wanted to see the operation firsthand before making an investment. I checked with the uh, Better Business Bureau in Oklahoma City. There was no complaints there. I had them checked out with a national uh, credit firm, and all their uh, resources uh, checked out the same uh, with, with this firm. I was satisfied that, uh, that they were uh, legitimate. And over on a little map, you'll see that all of our suppliers are from overseas. At London. Fidelity National was certainly impressive. Orders were pouring in. Workers were busily taking inventory and answering a constant stream of phone calls. Robert, this is our gene room. I can't take you into the warehouse because it's a bonded warehouse. You know, we have pharmaceuticals and, well, you know how it is. For security, sure. What you see here... The warehouse was equally impressive. Thousands of boxes were stacked behind locked doors, awaiting delivery to distributors. You see by the packing labels here that all these would be ready. Their financials uh, indicated that uh, they had 2.8 million uh, or so of inventory uh, in various locations. More comes in next weekend. Jones took the plunge and purchased a distributorship for $54,000, his life savings. He was just one of more than 300 people who had made investments totaling $1.2 million. But as the money flooded in, the Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS became increasingly suspicious. On February 17, 1992, agents from the FBI, the IRS, and the Oklahoma City Police made a surprise raid on Fidelity National's headquarters. You can tell by you lifting five or six boxes at one time. There's nothing in any of the boxes that you can tell. No, there isn't. When they went into the boxes, they found that they were completely empty. A few minutes when we commenced the We found no evidence that Fidelity had in any way purchased, ordered, received, or shipped during the entire course of their business life any medical supplies. Uh, the inventory which we found when we executed search warrants at their warehouse 
would fit on the side of my desk. Investigators painstakingly checked every single box in the warehouse. Every single box was empty, and the masterminds of the operation had long since disappeared. These are not amateurs. These people have obviously done this in the past. They knew what they were doing. They did it very quickly. They knew how to get in. They knew how to get out. They knew how to set up the accounts without putting fingerprints on the accounts. We believe the leader of this operation was a gentleman named Richard Condia. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.